tweet about today's session using the hashtag equity first. So now I'd like to give a proper introduction to our guest, uh, the renowned Dr. Sean Harper, who in addition to leading USC's Race and Equity Center, is the Provost Professor in the Rossier School of Education and the Marshall School of Business at the University of Southern California. He's also the Clifford and Betty Allen Chair in Urban Leadership at USC and Editor-at-Large of Time Magazine. Dr. Harper just finished his term as the 2020-21 President of the American Educational Research Association and was recently elected to the National Academy of Education in 2021. So in addition to all of this, uh, Sean Harper is a master teacher who I believe is beginning his 19th year as a faculty member and has a host of current and former students who he has mentored and supported as they've launched their careers. Dr. Harper, thank you for joining us today. Dr. Howard, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to spend this time with you and our colleagues around the world. Wonderful, as am I. And we've already decided that we have at least two hours of content and questions uh, that we could have for this session. So I'm going to dive right in. Um, Sean, we know that you are a uh, prolific scholar. You've written several books. Uh, you have been tapped for your expertise around race and equity issues by organizations of all sorts. And we are going to dive into all of that. But I'd like to set the stage by just having you share with your audience a little bit about your background. So where are you from? Um, where did you grow up? Tell us a little bit about your family life, because all of that, of course, has helped shape the person that you are today. Sure. I love this question. I grew up in Thomasville, Georgia, which is a small town right on the Georgia-Florida border. Um, my hometown is quite stratified racially. Um, my family grew up, I, I grew up very, very poor, and my family was very poor and continues to be quite poor. Um, most of the Black folks in my town were poor. Most of the white folks in my town were rich. They were in charge of things. Uh, they led things. Um, I somehow knew Danette uh, as, a, as a young boy, honestly. I, I often say I was like a five-year-old social scientist. I knew at like five years old that we weren't poor because we wanted to be. We were not poor because we lacked ambition and we surely were not poor because we were lazy. My mother was a housekeeper. She cleaned white people's homes uh, for very little money. That was really, really hard work. Um, I dare somebody to call my mama lazy, right? So I knew that it wasn't because we were, you know, all those things that I said. Um, but I didn't know, obviously, at five years old what it was. When I became an adolescent, um, you know, my analysis became, you know, a bit more sophisticated. And I started to understand that there were these unspoken cultural norms around race and racism. People often avoided what, for me, was hiding in plain sight. So there were all of these, like, racial politics and racial tensions, but nobody was talking about them. Um, so, you know, those things, you know, became a bit of a sort of the, the, the genesis of my intellectual curiosity. I wanted to understand, you know, uh, racial stratification um, and the commingling of, of race and socioeconomic status. And why is it that black folks and other people of color are almost always on the losing end of that stratification? I wanted to more deeply understand, you know, racial dynamics and, you know, interracial uh, interactions. So that was it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, well that, that that is a wonderful setup for the rest of our discussion. And I wanna come back to um, a few specific things that you just mentioned, but I wanna just continue this progression from childhood uh, into your college years, graduate school, you know, your life as a faculty member. Was there a moment when you kind of deliberately decided that you were going to make a focus on equity, justice, uh, reckoning with racism, your life's work? Or is it something that just over time you realize that you not only had a lived experience that helped inform uh, the way that you approached the work and the way that you did the work, 
but that you also had a particular set of skills and expertise that allowed you to reach people in different ways? Or was it a combination of the two? Sure. Um, definitely a combination of the two. But let me let me start where I left off with the previous response, right? So it was like all of this racial stuff that I learned in Thomasville, um, in, in my town. Um, and I forgot to mention that Thomasville is about, or at least at the time um, that I was growing up, was about 50-50 black and white. Um, there were, I went to school with no Asian or Asian American persons or Latinx persons. There was this one Latino family that migrated through our town, um, uh, when I was in eighth grade and I became friends, uh, with the girl who was in, in my, in my grade, but that was it. Everybody else, it was, you know, 50, 50 black and white. So there was that context. But then I went to Albany state, my amazing, wonderful public historically black university in Albany, Georgia. It was there uh, where there was this ever presence of black brilliance and affirmation of black cultural history, black cultural identities. Um, you know, we didn't have to use our imagination to, uh, to, to imagine what black excellence looked like. We saw it in the faculty members and the administrators there. I had such an amazing four years at that HBCU. I was a very engaged student leader there, which was sort of the genesis of my, uh, my set of research interests on student engagement. That part of it was a lived experience for me. It was just, I, I can't say enough about the value of that experience for me and you know all of those other black kids. The overwhelming majority of us were Pell Grant recipients, by the way. Um, it, it was just it was just great. Then, Danette, I graduated from Albany State and went immediately to Bloomington, Indiana, not far from where you are, for graduate school at Indiana University. And in my first semester in my master's program, we were reading this all this stuff that was assigned to us about diversity in higher ed and the experiences of black students on white campuses. And, you know, the stuff that I was reading was so inconsistent with my own lived experience as an undergraduate student at my, at my HBCU. I was so fascinated by the, the pain, the trauma, the inequities. I, I just, I just found it. I found it so fascinating and, you know, it became honestly, yet another sort of genesis for my long time now study of, of race and racial equity. I wanted to understand what is it about these predominantly white institutional contexts that manufacture for black students and black faculty and staff, mm -hmm. um, you know, these horrific experiences that are so different from the one I had at my HBCU. Um, so th that was really, that was really it. But I knew Danette, the more I read, the more I researched, and certainly the more time I spent with Black students and Black employees on white campuses, that this couldn't be just kind of a recreational, you know, um, set of research interests for me. Mm -hmm. There's so much, there was so much work to do then. And sadly, two decades later, there remains so much work to do now. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, once I made the discovery of these experiences, and I understood how deep they were and are, you know, I just couldn't walk away from, well, once you know, you can't unknow. Right, right, for sure. And you've gotten us right to the heart of the work that we do at Lumina, which is uh, you know, broadening pathways to learning beyond high school uh, for so many more individuals, because we know that um, that's one of the surest ways to lift an individual out of poverty, to provide greater opportunities, not just for an individual, but for everyone in his or her family. So I want to go back to something you said about um, the role of your undergraduate institution, Albany State and HBCU. One of the several things we have in common is we are both effusive about our HBCU experience and the role that it played in you know, launching us into our careers and professional lives. But um, you know, those institutions and other institutions that are game changers for students who uh, don't have uh, limitless opportunities, institutions like uh, community colleges, institutions like um, 
uh, Hispanic serving institutions and, and, and tribal colleges and universities, they are much different than um, the kinds of, I would say, very selective, um, seemingly uh, very prestigious institutions where you've, you've worked and made your faculty career, Dr. Harper, uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, University of Southern California. And so how do you reconcile you know, those two? And uh, tell us a little bit about the role that you think that set of institutions that are priority institutions for Lumina Foundation should play as we continue to have conversations about the role of post-secondary education in providing greater opportunity, particularly for the least among us. Yeah, no, this is this is great. Um, obviously, I am such a proponent of MSIs uh, collectively, um, and certainly community colleges. Um, we last summer. A week after the murder of George Floyd, we launched here in our center the what we now call the California Community Colleges Racial Equity Leadership Alliance, which brings together 68 community colleges across California. And we do campus racial climate assessments at each of the 68 for students, faculty, and staff. We um, do professional learning experiences once a month on a different racial equity topic. Um, and each of those member institutions sends five people to the monthly uh, e-convenings. And we also aggregate a set of very practical racial equity um, resources for each of the member institutions. I, I, I mentioned the Alliance because we're obviously not a community college, but yet we're able to marshal the resources of the University of Southern California to mm -hmm. you know, create this network of community colleges and have them profit from what we know, the research that, that we do, and you know, the reputation that we have amassed for, for, for this work. Um, so that, that's one way that we you know, at least attempt to reconcile you know, being at a very elite place, but yet you know, the overwhelming majority of our time is spent not studying elite places. Um, I, I, I will say though, Danette, and I know we're gonna get into this into this later, but it, it feels like now, now's a good time to sure. at, at least sort of cue it up. One of the things that I have learned over the years is that black folks are catching hell everywhere, mm. right? Um, there is a presumption that, well, at, you know, Fortune, 100 companies, if you emerge to, you know, the C-suite at those places, you're good, right? No, you're not good. Um, there's so, there's just so much racial stress and so many racialized experiences and racism that's experienced by those Black women, men, and genderqueer persons who um, ascend to those roles. That same thing is true of elite um, predominantly white private colleges and universities. It's a mistake to presume that Black students at Stanford, for example, or at Penn or here at USC, that, oh yeah, they're, they're all good. Like, no, they're, they're the, the same kinds of racism that is experienced in our broader society. Being at an elite institution does not afford one immunity from or exemption from from those experiences. I just thought that I just dropped that here. Let me let, let me go back though uh, to your your question about priority institutions. There's so much that I appreciate about Lumina. Almost chief among them, right, is that you have made um, the most chronically underserved institutions your priority. I think that's exactly right. It's praiseworthy. I appreciate it. That's the place where the majority of us are. Um, and I, I just, I really appreciate Lumina's investment there. Don't change that. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. We, we don't plan to change that, but it, it, it's so um, affirming to hear that from you. And, and I, I was going to go a certain place in the conversation, but I just want to continue on this thread that you've started uh, about, um, you know, certain groups, Black people, 
um, Latinx, Asian American um, populations and immigrant populations, you know, are, don't have an easy route most places. And one of the things I've heard you speak quite a bit about over the last several months is the violence that has been waged against uh, Asian American, American and immigrant communities. And your strong advice to institutions in particular to be mindful of that phenomenon as uh, all campuses reopen in the fall, to pay particular attention to uh, Asian students who oftentimes are the invisible um, uh, population of students on campus. So I was wondering if you might say just a word or two about that based upon some of the work you've done over the last year um, specifically. Yeah, um, I feel really strongly about this. Um, I had the pleasure of testifying again to uh, Congress last summer. There was a congressional hearing on COVID and you know the reopening of college campuses. And I talked about this there and it seemed to not have gotten very much traction or attention. And I, I was just, this, my, my emotions about this were snowballing. The, the, the longer we went on and not just in the hearing, but afterwards and people were not paying attention to, um, you know, like just these reports of physical and verbal attacks on people who appeared to be Asian either Asians or Asian American people or Pacific Islander persons um, across the country. You know, there were these news stories across the country and people were just not taking them as seriously as, as I thought they should. Um, and as I last summer went down the rabbit hole of analyzing campus reopening plans, mm -hmm. uh, those that were public facing on college and university websites, I was just noticing that no attention is being paid to how are we going to welcome Asian and Asian American students, faculty and staff back to our community and mm -hmm. ensure their safety. Um, I still, frankly, even with the tragedy in Atlanta and with, you know, the, the attacks in San Francisco and other places around the country, even with that stuff in the Stop, Hage, Stop Asian Hate Movement, mm -hmm. I still don't think that colleges and universities are paying close enough attention to how are we going to ensure the safety of these persons when we welcome them back for in-person teaching, learning, and living um, this fall? It, it's just, it's, it's maddening. Um, let me also say though, right, that those attacks, for sure, there's been an escalation of them throughout the pandemic that can be reasonably um, attributed to, you know, a certain someone in someone's referring to it as Kung flu and the China virus and all that ridiculousness. Um, there, there's that. But the more important thing that I want to say is that for years and years and years, there is another form of violence against Asian Americans that I've been hearing about in my work. And it is their erasure. Mm -hmm. Students, faculty, and staff members alike in higher education and in corporate contexts have talked with my colleagues and me for years about the invisibility they feel, the unimportance they feel, um, the ways in which they are erased, um, the whole very, it's not even a notion, the reality of the bamboo ceiling, um, right? It's just like the glass ceiling for women in many um, organizational contexts. Um, there's this, this bamboo ceiling where, you know, Asian Americans, you know, um, there are certain cultures and policies and practices and companies that prevent them from ascending to high levels of leadership. We got to pay attention to that. Mm, absolutely. And that gets us to some of the work that you're doing at the Race and Equity uh, Center at USC. And um, I, I think I heard you say that a lot of people um, want, uh, a lot of people have made commitments to racial equity, but a lot of people don't know how to do racial equity. And at the center, you and your colleagues help people do the hard work. Uh, I watched an interview um, that you recorded about five weeks after the murder of George Floyd. And you mentioned that at no other time in the center's existence, and, and, and the center has been around for a long time, well over a decade, um, at no other time in the center's existence had the demand for your services 
and expertise been greater. And you also said um, there hadn't been another period of time, and, and this was a five week period, where you'd learned so much. So now here we are, uh, 13 months after George Floyd's murder, which prompted this moment of national reckoning around race. What have you learned in this last year? Yeah, um, I've learned more than ever. Um, I meant it when I said it in that interview that you that you saw, and I, I mean it now. Um, throughout the pandemic, at this point, more than 54,000 professionals have been here in my home for live virtual professional learning experiences around race. I know that it appears that I'm like in some like Hollywood studio, but I'm actually in my guest room uh, just with a black backdrop. But more than 54,000 people have, have been here. Um, it's time to change the virtual carpet for sure. But um, you know, I have learned during this time that people don't know what they're doing mm. as it pertains to racial equity. I kind of sort of knew it beforehand, obviously, but I don't know, it's just become much, much, much more um, acute for me, that, that understanding. Um, and I don't mean just in higher education. I also mean in K-12, the center has a portfolio of K-12 work as well as in our, in our corporate work. Um, so I've certainly learned that I have learned, and I'm just going to say once again, and not for dramatic effect, but it's just a matter of fact, I have learned that Black folks are catching hell everywhere. Mm -hmm. I, I think, Danette, I, I didn't quite know that as um, as well as I, as I understand it now, a year ago. I, I, you know, as we've had so many organizations, institutions, foundations, um, and other places come to us and, you know, like we do our workplace uh, racial climate assessments and our professional learning experiences and so on. Um, you know, I just continue to learn from professionals of color generally and from Black professionals specifically and especially just the amount of um, racism they experience and for women of color, the intersectionality of race and gender for them, uh, racism and sexism that they experience. Um, I've just learned a whole lot more about, uh, about the realities and the, and the sort of ever presence of those experiences. Mm. Um, on a positive note, um, I have learned from some amazing companies um, like Anheuser-Busch and Sun Life Insurance and Nike. Those are three that, that we're working with of, of many. But I've learned from those three, they have very, very sophisticated diversity, equity, and inclusion operations. Mm -hmm. I mean, like real sophisticated. Mm -hmm. I have not seen a college or university ever with that kind of sophisticated multi-dimensional, very systematic approach to DEI. Um, so I, you know, in, in the next chapter of my work, I'm going to import some of these, you know, some of these templates, frameworks, systems, and so on that, that, I've, that I've discovered in, in the corporate space um, to my higher education work. Because I actually think that there's something, you know, serious to, to, to learn from those. I'll stop there. Well, I, I'm going to uh, do a, a couple of follow-ups because um, you mentioned so many really important points. Um, I have a, a good friend who is an executive at Nike, and when we advertised this webinar, she responded immediately with how excited she was because of the work that you're doing with them. And so is there something that you have learned from the corporate sector and with all those companies that you named and the others that you haven't named that you've been working with, that we should really, those of us who are working in the post-secondary learning space, learning beyond high school, that we should seriously consider adopting a practice, a policy, uh, a way of doing business um, that you haven't seen um, 
or that you haven't seen normalized in the higher ed space? Yeah, you know, it, it's going to be a double click of of the point I made in, a few moments ago about just the systematic approach mm-hmm. to DEI broadly and even racial equity. Um, there's so much sort of haphazardness that happens in the post-secondary learning space as it pertains to equity. It's just like a bunch of randomness at times. Mm-hmm. Um, or there are pockets of institutional activity over here and over there, but not over here, right? And there, you know, it, it's just not very systematized. Um, I, I think that we can learn from, you know, the corporate engineers, if you will, um, you know, how to engineer a system that really touches all of our policies, our practices, our curricula, so on and so forth, um, in a, in a much less haphazard, um, disconnected, fragmented kind of way. Um, colleges and universities are notorious for that. Um, one other thing that I'll say is that colleges and universities are also notorious for, um, sort of putting all of the onus on the cultural centers or the multicultural affairs director or the chief diversity officer. Um, I have seen in lots of companies, uh, Zoom, for example, where my friend Damian Hooper Campbell is the CDO. Um, not everything DEI is put on Damian, right? Like um, Zoom as, as a company with Damian's leadership um, has just, they don't place it all at, at, at his feet in the ways that I've just seen way too many colleges and universities do mm-hmm. with their CDOs. Well, I, I heard you say that one of the questions that you were most often asked uh, in, in June and July of 2021 is, should we hire a chief diversity officer? And your response was, you know, if this is your first time thinking about this, if this is your knee-jerk reaction, then absolutely not. You should not hire a chief diversity officer because it's like putting a Band-Aid on, you know, a, a, a gaping wound that needs surgery. So can you just talk a little bit about why your advice was no, unless you do these things? And what were those like specific things that you thought needed to happen to make that role uh, more centralized, right? To give it some, uh, lots of credibility and also lots of um, authority, right? It wasn't just off in a corner but it was uh, central to the success of the institution or the corporation. Could you say a word or two? I, I will. Um, but let me first, let me first. You, you, you're right. Like last summer, that was the sort of flavor of the day. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you what the ridiculous flavor of the day was in March and April of okay. 2021. Um, lots of mostly corporate leaders, not, not higher ed leaders, but mostly corporate leaders were reaching out to me with the straightest face asking me, should we celebrate Juneteenth this year? Mm. Did you celebrate it last year? Uh, yeah. Well, why wouldn't you celebrate it this year? I don't understand. Oh, it's because you jumped on the bandwagon last year because it was fashionable and in vogue and because everybody was doing it at that time. Uh, following the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. And, you know, folks were putting their black boxes on on, on their social media accounts that one day. Y'all were doing that kind of performative, um, you know, support. Uh, right, That that's what it was for you. Um, so, yeah, no, you should absolutely celebrate Juneteenth in perpetuity. Um, that was my advice. Um, so back to the, the uh, chief diversity officer. So, Danette, what I said to those folks is... Um, you know, I raised a set of questions before I got to the advice giving, right? Um, how long have you been thinking about and talking about hiring a CDO? Oh, two weeks? Oh, okay. <laughs> Y'all just trying to do something um, right now because it's fashionable. Okay. Um, that person, um, what are you looking for in the person? We, we, we don't know. Oh, okay. Um, the person's staff, how many people are you prepared to hire? to work on that person's team. Wait, you mean we got to hire a staff? Yeah, no, you do. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, And that can't be, the staffing can't be the budget, the whole budget. What about the rest of the budget? What budget are you going to give that person 
to do programming, to bring in, you know, experts. Um, you should not expect that person to be an expert on on, on everything. They're going to have to bring in experts. You know, like how you have to bring in McKinsey and BCG and Accenture and PwC for for you know other organizational kinds of things. You have to bring that person's going to have to bring the USC Race and Equity Center and you know other experts to the table to to help. What? How much? How much budget do you have to give that person? Oh, we don't we don't have a budget. Well, no, you shouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. Is my answer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I think that that's a good set of questions for for any organization to begin with, um, as they are thinking about a new role as the solution. Um, But that's also connected to something that I've been thinking a lot about, which is uh, last summer, there was this um, unprecedented uh, conversation happening about racial equity. Uh, Companies were putting out pledges, social media campaigns, everyone uh, wanted to be known as supporting Black Lives Matter. And Over the months, we've seen less and less of that, at least less and less of it um, verbalized or articulated, Sean. Um, There was just recently an article in the New York Times that showed that support for Black Lives Matter, for example, is is actually uh, lower now among um, whites than it was at the beginning of 2020. So my question for you is, all of these efforts that, or all of these commitments that were made and the efforts that were put in place, all of the organizations that were reaching out to your center for support, what can be done to ensure that the work is sustained? That it's not just the popular thing to do for the moment, but that it remains. And that these conversations that have started over the last year continue. How can we ensure that? Yeah, this is good. Um, which I'm going to say to a chief strategy officer, with tremendous strategy and intentionality, um, those are essential ingredients for sustainability. Um, I'll unpack that a bit in, in a second. I don't have the number right in front of me, um, but a couple of weeks ago, we did some analysis here at the center and there was like this huge like number. I don't know. I don't have the number right in front of me, but because I wasn't the person doing the analysis and I don't, I don't micromanage my staff, but let's just say that the number was, I don't know, a hundred billion dollars. Let's just say, right. That folks, companies and other people pledged last summer, a hundred billion dollars. Like, I don't know, 99 billion, 900, whatever. I don't do math well at times. The point here, right, is that so many of these companies, especially, made these headline grabbing announcements about their investment into racial equity. And here we are a year later, and the money is just sitting there, like it's, it's, it's unspent, it's uncommitted because they don't know what to do with it. There's no strategy, right? They don't even know who to give it to. Do we give it to the NAACP? Do we give it to Black Lives Matter? Do we give it to Black colleges? It's just that, it, it's just maddening to me um, that there was such a manipulation of the moment uh, to get, you know, press uh, for you know, seeming commitment, but ultimately not. So there's that. All right. So what can we do um, instead? I am going to talk quickly, Danette, about two things. I'm going to start with Nike, then bring it into higher education. One of the things that we are doing with Nike is we're doing like five things with them, but one of the things is they're 200 senior most executives, the highest level executives, are going through a series with us on understanding and addressing systemic racism in the Americas. Um, And, you know, I I haven't asked people their ages. That's rude. Um, But 
you know, these are folks who are, you know, fairly, fairly adult. And it is really clear to me that the things that, 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 that we're engaging that, you know, they haven't had an opportunity elsewhere in their educational or professional upbringings to, um, to engage those things. That same thing is required in higher education. Um, I talked about the Community College Alliance. I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention that um, we created a liberal arts colleges, racial equity leadership alliance that has 71 colleges and universities. Um, my dear friend, Lori White, who's the president of DePaul uh, University in Greencastle, this was her brainchild. She saw that we were doing it with the community colleges. She reached out and said, Sean, we got to do this with you know liberal arts colleges. Um, just not even an hour ago. Um, so my clock says it's 37 minutes past the hour. 37 minutes ago, hundreds of faculty, staff, and administrators from those 71 liberal arts colleges were convened for a three-hour professional learning experience on disaggregating data uh, for the advancement and actualization of racial equity. That was the topic of this month. Like the, like the Community College Alliance, the Liberal Arts Alliance, Alliance every month, there is a three-hour professional learning experience on a different racial equity topic that is focused on practice, that is focused on doing racial equity, solving racial problems. Each of those 71 colleges gets to send up to eight employees uh, to the live convenings. And then we make the resources available to every, literally everybody on their campuses, all employees, not just the eight that they send. You know, we need more of that, right? More opportunities, more formal opportunities to upskill people who work in higher education on the practice of racial equity. Otherwise, how are they going to do it? How, how? It's like uh, expecting somebody to be, I don't know, an amazing baker. My husband's a great baker, um, but they've never baked. They've never taken a baking class, right? Uh, it's not, they're just not going to magically produce a wedding cake, um, right? Like the, those same kinds of, we take that same approach to understanding that people never learn this stuff and we got to teach them. And I, I, I so appreciate what you're saying because I think that there's often an assumption that because people mean well, they know how to do well when it comes to the racial equity work. And we, just like anything to your point, you have to be upskilled. You have to have some competencies and some professional development. You know, you said earlier, you know, you were kind of um, shocked at the extent to which people didn't know how to do the racial equity work. And so there is no shame in not knowing. Right, but it's what do you do then? What you realize that you may not know and that you need to know. What what do you do? And so, Sean, we work with a lot of organizations at Lumina that are smaller, you know, nonprofits, uh, completely run on uh, grant dollars, and they can't hire very expensive consultants to come in and spend you know several days. Every dollar is connected to a project. I think there's a role that philanthropy can play there to provide some resources to do the work. But what would you say to those organizations who don't know what first step to take? Yeah, um, you know, I have one word, alliances. Mm. Aligning with other institutions that are similarly sized and similarly resourced and, you know, going on this journey together um, is, is, is one way to do it, one way to make it affordable. It also provides an opportunity, I think, for philanthropists um, and for foundations to, you know, su su support, the, support the alliance. That way the, the financial burden isn't on the individual nonprofits or the individual small struggling colleges or universities. Um, you know, their participation is, is, is funded by, um, by, by, by the external dollars. I think that's the way to go. Um, I, you know, we talked about what I've learned over these past 13 months. Honestly, 
through these two alliances that we've created here for the liberal arts colleges and the community colleges, I've learned so much about the power of bringing, you know, institutions with similar characteristics together, um, creating a space for them to learn not only alongside each other, but also from each other and to do some stock taking of, you know, excellence that may be happening um, in, in one area on one dimension of racial equity, you know, at this set of institutions, but not so much from those. But then with those, you know, there's another thing that they're doing well that these institutions can learn from. You know, I just think that the potential there is, is, is limitless. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that small colleges or small nonprofits, you know, ought to get together with others, similarly committed others that, you know, are demographically similar in terms of size and so on, um, you know, and, and try to, you know, tackle this, these things together. Yes, that's a, that's a great answer. Thank you. So I have one more question that I'm going to pose and then we're going to turn to the audience questions. I know that you are working on um, several different book projects right now. And two. Just two, two. Not several. Okay. I wasn't sure. I knew that was at least two. <laughs> so um, one of the books that you are working on is really examining um climate issues for college students, uh, the racialized experiences of different college students. And one of the chapters in that book, I, I believe, um, is going to be entitled The Miseducation of White America. Mm -hmm. And it deals with how higher education institutions have in fact failed its students, particularly its white students, because so many students can go through their entire college career and never take a course that requires them to confront our nation's history with racism. Mm -hmm. So I, I would just love for you to speak on that, particularly as we have, since the beginning of the year, um, been faced with this backlash against critical race theory or really against, uh, in some instances, any teaching of the systemic racism and structural racism whose vestiges linger on today. So enlighten us, please, on that point. Yes, of course. Um, it's a foolish thing to attempt to write two books simultaneously. <laughs> Don't do that. This is dumb. Don't do it. Um, but I'm, I'm attempting to do it. So I'm going to put them in conversation with each other uh, quickly here. So, Danette, I think you've summarized it quite well. In Race Matters in College, that third chapter of the Miseducational White America, um, I do, in fact, very credibly make the point that white people, white students can persist through four or five or six years or more of college without ever not only taking a course that, you know, very seriously grapples with America's racial history, but also without really ever having any meaningful conversation about race. How could I say that so declaratively? because white students have said it to me so declaratively over the years in our qualitative uh, campus racial climate assessments. Um, so the point that I make in the book in that particular chapter is that those college students then graduate and they go into the world, they go into the professions. Mm -hmm. It remains the case in every industry in the American economy that white people comprise the overwhelming majority of managers, leaders, executives, so on and so forth. Uh, when we look at the composition of the governorship across America, most governors, almost all of them are white. Uh, when we look at the racial makeup of our Congress, the House and the Senate, overwhelmingly white, right? Yes, there have been some strides in diversifying um, the Congress, but still, the overwhelming majority of those folks are white. Same is true in K-12 education. 80% of teachers are white. The overwhelming majority of them are white women. College presidents, overwhelming majority are white. The point here, right, is that we send college-educated white people into the world, millions of them, every year with college degrees in hand, and yet we haven't taught them much at all about race. Well, then they go into their roles 
reproducing racial harm, not understanding the experiential realities of communities of color. Some of them go and make policy that literally, um, you know, has incredible effects on millions of, of, of people of color. Um, colleges and universities are partly responsible, ultimately, for the racism that is reproduced in our society because we miseducated those who, um, you know, who occupy those positions of leadership. So that then brings me, Danette, to the other book that I'm foolishly writing at the same time, The Anti-Racist Workplace, okay. which is all about not just corporations and, you know, businesses, but also it draws on my research in the higher ed workplace. Mm -hmm. um, we spend a lot of time, and I, I, I get it, I understand it, we spend a lot of time talking about students and student outcomes and racial inequities that disadvantage students of color. I, I, I get it. But it's also important for us to understand that faculty, staff, and administrators of color on college and university campuses, that, that there are so many inequities that we also experience, right? And this just, it, it's, it's a way, it's a really fascinating way that I am able to put my corporate research in conversation with my higher ed research. So in the anti-racist workplace, you know, I'm, I'm writing about um, how, um, why is the workplace so racist? Well, the people who run it came from places that didn't prepare them to advance and sustain racial equity in their workplaces. How, 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 else, how else would they know how to do it then? Um, yeah, so, hey, I'll stop there so we have some time for questions. Okay, so we're, we're going to be looking forward for both books to, to, to be published. And so, so let us know, please, when that happens. Um, so we have a couple of questions here. The first question actually uh, is speaking to something that we discussed earlier, which is um, the decreasing support for Black Lives Matter and movements around this national reckoning uh, around race. And so um, this person says, Sean, you say that people don't know how to do this work, but I wonder if you ever think that people actually care, if people actually care about making significant changes. Is this a moment in time where it's cool to look like we're doing equity work, but people aren't actually interested in changing anything? What are you seeing? Um, equity work is trendy. It's on trend right now. Um, but this person is is right, right? Like I'm reading and and, and you know just reflecting on the subtext of the question. Um, the, the 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 person is right. Um, is it an authentic, deep sense of care for Black people that brings folks to the streets to march for Black lives? Or is it that it was just a thing that was trendy to do and that you don't want to seem like you're racist or uncommitted? So yeah, that's the easy thing. Look, I wrote these two articles last summer um, one is about a white woman named Meg and another is about a white guy named Chuck. Um, they both are public open access. One is in the Grio and the other is in Ebony magazine. Um, just Google um, them, right? Um, you know, in those two pieces, I wrote about how Chuck and Meg were engaging in all of this performative activism last summer. Mm -hmm following the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. But in Meg's case, Meg didn't have any Black people on her team. She microaggresses all the Black folks who report to her. You know, it's just like all this stuff. Like Meg was not understanding her the, the ways in which she so routinely contradicted herself mm -hmm. around these things. So, you know, I, I think same, same with Chuck. Same with Chuck. Um, the point here, though, right, is that it racial equity work requires some deep 
reflection and grappling with one's own contradictions. It requires feedback on, um, you know, the, the, the demonstrated commitment. Um, the, the, these are individual actions um, that, that I'm talking about. It requires some remediation of racial illiteracy um, and, and, and skill building, right? Um, it, it can't be just the declarations that, yeah, Black Lives Matter, um, I really care about Black folks. Um, in the words of the late, great Whitney Houston, show me the receipts. Show me the receipts. Okay, so we, we have um, just a few more minutes left here, Sean. And so I'm actually going to try to combine the next two questions, and then I'll ask um, a final question. So um, this question is from David Wilson, uh, president of Morgan State. He says, thank you for speaking so passionately about your empowering experience as an undergraduate student at Albany State University. My students here at Morgan feel similarly about their experiences. What do you think predominantly white institutions, if they are genuinely open to truly creating more empowering experiences for non-white students can learn from HBCUs? So that's the first question. And then I'm just going to add to that one, a question we got from another participant. And that is, um, you know, you've talked a lot about um, the impact that the last 13 months have had on higher education. How has that uh, affected hiring in higher education and what questions should church committees be asking? So they're not really related, but they are both about higher education, Dr. Dr. Harper. So maybe you could take a stab at both of them in the next couple minutes. All right. So first, I love, love, love Morgan State University, and I'm a huge appreciator of President Wilson's. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think quite simply, as a matter of fact, one thing that other institutions can learn from Morgan State and from Albany State and the other HBCUs is how to do curriculum, how to um, create what my favorite Morgan State University alum, Gloria Latson Billings, calls culturally relevant and culturally responsive curricula. Um, HBCUs have been doing that for years. You know, I was reading as a first year student at Albany State about James Baldwin and W.E.B. Du Bois and Ida B. Wells and so on. I think that, you know, um, there's so many faculty members, and I don't think I know this for sure. There's so many faculty members at predominantly white institutions who are like, I don't know how to decolonize the curriculum. I don't know how to make the curriculum more responsive to 21st century learners. Um, you know, a, a, a cultural and curricular exchange with HBCUs, I think could be a real learning opportunity for faculty members to learn how to do it. The second, um, it's related to curriculum. It's also about pedagogy and how do you create inclusive classroom environments. HBCU faculty members are experts on that, not just for Black students. You know, I am reminded when I was at Albany State, there was an occasional white student, an occasional Latinx student, so on and so forth, right? Occasional Asian student. The majority of us overwhelmingly were Black, but occasionally, you know, there, there, were, there, there were the others from other racial and ethnic groups. Those faculty members, and I'm not romanticizing, they were very skillful at including the non-Black students in classroom conversations and learning experiences inside and outside the classroom. Um, you know, there are way too few faculty members at predominantly white institutions who are A, skilled at doing it, and B, even willing to do it. So yeah, love it. Second question about the hiring. Yes. Um, Lots of places have not been hiring. Uh, there have been hiring freezes. Even here at USC, a very well-resourced university, we were on like an 11-month hiring freeze. Um, what, what, what I will say is coming out of the pandemic, there will be a period of recovery. Mm -hmm. I had the enormous privilege of serving on California Gavin Newsom's uh, statewide task force on higher education, racial equity, and COVID-19 recovery. There's lots of money 
coming you know, through the state legislatures across the country and through federal dollars that will help us recover financially from um, you know, much of what's been lost or stifled during the pandemic. It would be a real shame to come out of that pandemic, resume hiring folks, and do it in the same old raceless way that we were doing it pre-pandemic. I think that this economic stimulus, if that's what, what we want to call it, that awaits us, right? It affords us an opportunity, a rare opportunity to be far more equity-minded. And I mean racial equity-minded mm -hmm. in our hiring practices. It'd be a real shame for search committees and you know others to just go and just uh, replenish what's been lost with what was there before. Um, yeah, that, that that's how I'm at least thinking about it today. That was great. You responded to both of those questions so well. So thank you. So we are we are almost at time, and I'm going to try to squeeze in um, two more questions. So um, you and I had a very special person in common, dear dear friend to both of us, the amazing uh, Dr. Andrew Nichols. Uh, and we lost him earlier this year after a very um, long and uh, valiant battle with brain cancer. And in fact, Dr. Nichols is the way that um, you and I got connected. I think over a decade ago, you were um, one of his, um, his final reference for a job that I hired him for. And so um, Drew was your master student, one of your first. He became a um, more like a little brother. He was an employee of mine, became more like a little brother. And he was so committed um, to this notion of racial equity. It, it is who he was. It was his life's work. Um, over the weekend, I just read uh, his final report, Segregation Forever, where he talks about um, the nation's most um, elite public institutions and how they had to do better on racial equity. So as you think about Drew and all that he accomplished in his short 39 years, uh, the impact that he left on the world, um, and you think about his legacy, what does he inspire you to continue doing in your own work? Yeah, that's, that's a beautiful question. Um, Andrew was my first ever PhD advisee. And, you know, over the years, after he graduated and, you know, he went into the workforce and just like started doing all of this high impact work. And like I read about him in the Chronicle of Higher Ed and Inside Higher Ed and all these places. Um, you know, I honestly was just so proud of and inspired by him and I continue to be. Um, one of my other mentees wrote to me on Father's Day, and I thought of Drew. And um, I, I don't have children, but this mentee wrote to me and said, um, you know, happy Father's Day. Just know that your legacy runs deep. Um, and I, I, I immediately thought about, about Drew and how now Drew has left me a legacy to sustain and continue, right? Like, I, I have a responsibility to his memory mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just all of the amazing experiences that we had to continue to advance the ball on racial equity. Um, it, it's, it, it is the single most important thing that I can do to honor him, to just remain committed to advancing advancing racial equity in ways that, that, that he was. Um, I'm such, I'm so proud to be a part of his legacy. Here, here. Beautiful. And so my last question for you, Sean, is, um, you know, you are one of the um, foremost leaders and thinkers on racial equity today. Um, organizations from all over the world come to you for your advice and expertise. What would you say to that little boy in Thomasville who was five-year-olds and who was trying to make sense of the chasm between the haves and the have-nots that seem to fall along racial lines? What would you say to your five-year-old self today? I would say to him, um, follow and embrace your curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, don't um, exchange it for, you know, other things that are seemingly more fun or 
seemingly easier, right? Um, that there are enormous social consequences that 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 can emerge from from your you know like lifelong determination to correct mm -hmm. the things that are so clear to you and 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 others right um that's that that's what i would say to my five-year-old self now 41 years later um yeah well i'm so grateful for your five-year-old um inquisitiveness and curiosity and for your 41 year old brilliance and for the 60 minutes that you have given us today um thank you so much dr harper we look forward to continuing to learn with you and to learn from you thank you for that Danette, Danette, yeah. before we go i'm 46 now um you said okay you don't look a day over 41 <laughs> all right I <I've>, <laughs> thank no. you so much Thank and you. thanks for everyone who joined. We look forward to seeing you on the next Equity First Conversation. Have a great afternoon.